to steal it, Did they take when on that ox fabric side that you're blowing to use this one thing that come up that I was giving anything Wait, oh, well, no, I don't just, know about this. You just replaced no, uh, uh, you just replaced it with the wrong side. What what is it? What piece is it? Like the like there's a piece right on the up cut? Is it the black? Yeah. Isn't that the music piece? I think there is that. But you're saying it's the opposite Okay. Which is going to do again. Well, but if, so remember that a fuse will blow at whatever current, right? And if you have a particular current demand for your devices, and you and it's it's more it's higher than your fuse rating, the fuse will blow all the time because that's that's why you don't size it. You have to size the fuse a certain way. I, I forgot to put that in the presentation about fuse sizing, but I trust some of you guys know about how we size the fuse, right? Uh, well, it's, in the, it's on the quiz. How do you size the fuse based on expected current draw, right? Uh, I was going to say with a ruler. <laughs> so, you know, what, what, how much current does the fuse, you know, because we say, if I recall the rules, it keeps fluctuating back. You, your fuse has to be sized at 150%, no more than 150% of your expected current drop, right? Is that the number? It's either 200 or 150%, whatever it is. Um, so how do you do that? And, and why do you do that is, you know, you, you're, gonna, you're gonna take a certain amount of current, you know, maximum that you're gonna draw from the car, and then if, if you go higher than that, it means that if you short circuit something, it might drive more current, and so you want to blow that fuse to protect your drag components, right? And so you size your fuse higher than how much current you want to draw, otherwise the fuse will always blow. Right. Uh, Instrumentation. Uh, we already do this sort of thing, but uh, the voltmeter obviously you're you're measuring the voltage across the different points, right? So if you're trying to find out, you know, in a battery and some load, how much voltage is across that load, you have to do it in a parallel circuit on one side to the other side. And you read the voltage, right? If you're trying to measure current, then Obviously, based on what we know in terms of a circuit, you've got to put an ammeter in series with the circuit, right? Because you don't want to be branching off the, the hoses to different locations, one for the ammeter and one for your load. You have to put it in line with the load. And so the ammeters are, are put in line with your load. Um, so, uh, in our system, we use something called a shunt. A, a shunt is basically a high precision resistor. So you know you have uh, you have terminals here, and then you have these little uh, metal bars that go across that provide a specific resistance. And because V equals I R. You can you can convert your current to resistance, right? So most of these shunts they uh, they they are marked this way. They, they go um, 50 amps equals 50 millivolts, or 50 amp equals 25 millivolts, or something. There's this conversion factor based on the resistance value of that shunt, and so uh, all the most of the ammeters we have are actually voltmeters with a shunt. So it just detects what is the voltage across here. 
the difference in millivolts, and then it, it detects those things. Um, as we said, um, amps versus amp hours is just a difference between you know amps over time. And so, if you have if you take samples along the way and you integrate over that, take the average current over a particular time, you can then get your amp hours. And this is what our e-meters are doing all the time, right? It's sampling and saying, it's recording down at a higher rate how much current we're getting along the way, and then you take the you know, integral over that, and that will give you the amount of capacity that we are drawing uh, from that. Okay, uh, from here on, uh, I'm going to talk about the theory behind some of the solar power components, and uh, I'll try to go through this quickly. Um, but solar cells, how they work is it's a sandwich of two different types of uh, typically silicon. One is called a P doped silicon, and one is called an N doped silicon. All you need to know is that because they're doped differently and then there's a barrier in between them, essentially they serve as a battery. Right? You've got a positive end and a negative end. And then as the sun hits the typically the negative end, it will excite electrons to go from the negative side, hopping over the barrier that's there, the depletion layer, into the positive side. And then then because the electrons negative, uh, naturally want to go back to the negative side, then it takes the wires that we connected to the solar cell and brings it back to the negative. And that's what causes a circuit. Okay? So, um, so you know, that's a solar cell generates energy by forcing those electrons to go over that depletion of right Okay? Um, as I said, typically they're silicon, but the higher um, the higher uh, efficiency cells use things like uh, gallium arsenide. And so uh, we, in our race, essentially are restricted to, uh, well, the class of division is restricted to terrestrial grade, otherwise known as the standard silicon. And then, uh, and then the, the uh, advanced division can use whatever what. OK, uh, this is a chart of solar cell efficiencies. Um, this is just more of a fun thing to, to note. Uh, way back when I started in 1997, solar cells were about 12% efficient or so. Nowadays, uh, and unfortunately, I, I'll send this out because it looks better on the monitor than on the wall, uh, but nowadays, uh, on here it will say something like sun power, and this reads 25%. So the what this chart is saying is the most efficient silicon grade, crystalline silicon grade cells are currently at 25%. And you can see that the the more uh, fancy things get up to like 40% efficiency. Yeah, it is pretty great. And then the, the red stuff is just all the emerging stuff about the flexible and all different different things. Like one module is already hit the Yeah. Well, no, there, there's no limit to the amount of solar cells you have other than the size, right? The five kilowatt hours is all about battery. Oh, battery okay. capacity, not solar cell capacity. Okay. okay. One of the key things you need to understand about a solar cell is that it doesn't provide constant power. Okay? We, we have a rating, right? We say that each panel is 100 watts. That's a, um, that's a hand-waving type of thing. Okay? Um, the solar cell operates at varying voltage levels, and at different voltage levels, they provide different currents. It's called an IV curve. Okay? If you look at this chart for an A300 sun power cell, at lower voltages, you get this, this nice straight line that's like, you know, 5.8 or so amps. 
Okay? So that's what we call the ISC, the current at short circuit. Um, you get that level. Of course, at the higher voltage, at the maximum voltage at 0.65 or so, you get zero volt, uh, zero amps. And so that's the voltage at open circuit. Okay? At some point in between there, because if the power is the, is the multiplication of the current and voltage, at some point, noted by these dotted lines, is a point in which the, the product of the current and voltage is the maximum level. Okay? Um, and that's what we call the maximum power point, or, or VMP for the voltage side, PMP for the power side. Okay, so what the what power trackers do is try to try to get the solar cells to operate at that particular level. Okay. Um, the other thing you need to know is that the solar cells operate at different temperature levels, and if, if this is a standard IV curve at 25 degrees Celsius. You'll see that at 40 degrees Celsius and at 60 degrees Celsius, the curve moves left. When the curve moves left, it means that you have less power because your, your current starts dropping earlier in the voltage and because you have a smaller voltage, you have smaller power, right? So it means that the hotter the temperature, the earlier the drop is. What's very interesting is, as I said, typical IV curves are calculated at 25 degrees Celsius, which as you can see on the chart, is 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Are we going to be running at 77 degrees Fahrenheit? No. So, you have to expect that your you know, what is it? One, two, three, six, nine, twelve and a half. Your 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 1.25 kilowatt panel isn't going to give you 1.25 kilowatts. Well, not only that. Uh, even, even if you were to put it so that it's directly facing the sun, you're still not going to get 1.25. This is also why we considered um, spraying down, and, people, and teams do this still, it's, it's a debate, and we'll talk about it today, but people spray down the panels with distilled water to lower the temperature so that we can move that graph that way. It is a debate, however, about whether or not we want to spray. Because um, how many of you guys have seen sudden changes in glass of temperature. If you go from cold, if, you have, if, you're, if you're in the mountains, you're cold, you turn on the defroster to the max heat, what happens? Foggy. Hmm? It will be foggy. Uh, that would be the, be the best, uh, best of that, but um, this happened to Matt and Ellen when they were in Colorado. And they, their, their car was stuck in the snow, and then they, they, they got it unstuck, and they turn on the defroster to the highest heat level. What happens? Crack on the windshield. Their, both their Jeep and their van have cracks like a, that, that wide on the windshield because they just tried to defrost it real quick. So t people typically uh, know to just sort of lower the windows and let it slowly come back up in temperature. If we spray, and we know that the silicon, right, silicon, if you think about it, is really just glass, right? And the solar cell is just glass. It's just opaque glass. So we were to spray cold or icy water on top of a hot cell, theoretically micro cracks are happening that could cause bad behavior in the solar cell. So, that's the current debate between um, do you spray or do you not spray? Spray, you increase the, the thing, but you could be damaging the cell. 
<clears throat> I think several years ago, we decided, based on hearing this concept of the micro cracks, that we will not spray the body call. We've decided we don't want to damage the cell. It's not worth moving the graph that way and damaging the cell. So we don't spray. But that means that we don't spray, you need to understand the effect that not spraying has on it. Okay. Um, it means that if there's any opportunity in which we can um, you know, slowly cool down the cells, we should do that. Of course, the only way to do that is shade the cells, which means that you're, you're going to <laughs> de decrease the power. So uh, uh, it's unlikely that's going to happen. But anyway, uh, but you know, most electronics run, run uh, better in the cold, right? This is why on there, there is that plastic panel right there uh, behind that metal sheet. We used to put bags of ice in there because we wanted to cool down the power trackers because the power trackers had a, had a temperature, it, it was adjusting for temperature where it would, you know, uh, say, oh, well, the temperature's higher, then I, I don't need as much voltage, it's just going to die quicker, so we just tricked the power trackers by putting bags of ice to make it cool. It didn't work quite well. Okay. Um, power trackers. Okay. Uh, power trackers are essentially DC to DC converters, right? They take one voltage level and convert it to another voltage level. In this case, the voltage of the array converted to the system voltage. Okay. So it really does two things. Um, it keeps the solar cell operating at the maximum power point. So at that curve, it goes and it detects and finds out, you know, uh, how, at what voltage do I really want to be at? Okay, it does that. And then secondly, uh, it, it tracks on the output side the voltage of the batteries. Okay? If you're given a particular constant power that, you know, basically solar cells produce power, you're given some amount of power. If you have lower voltage, what happens to the current? You get higher currents, right? And how do we calculate battery capacity? Current over time, right? So, if you can minimize the voltage so that you can maximize your current, you will recharge your batteries faster. Now, the other, the flip side of that is, you cannot charge the battery unless your supply voltage is higher than the battery voltage, right? It, 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 in terms of pressure, you have pressure equalization. So if your battery is higher than your, than your supply, it's actually going to want to try to charge the other way. And it will actually, try, the battery will try to discharge into the solar array. Is that why um, when, the, when the solar on charge was disconnected, it showed like 52 volts? Yes. Or higher volts, and then our battery showed like 50 volts. Yes. It, it's it's, it's going to, well, I, I should rephrase. So when you say the solar shows 52, that, that, was, was, that, that was when it was, oh, yeah, um, in part. But not really. That, that's just the that's just the DC conversion uh, with the power tracker. Um, however, you do need to note that if the motor or batteries were disconnected, you will have a higher output voltage from the power trackers than you would if the batteries were connected. This is because there is no load for which the, the current will flow. And so, so the, the open circuit voltage will be higher because there's, there's nothing... Trying to the, 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 if, if, I'm, if I have a hose, I'm, I'm flowing, the, the current is flowing, the, the pressure of the water decreases slightly, right? Just because it, 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 it flows, it lets out. 
And so, if you have um, if you have no current flowing, your voltage stays at a higher level. Once you attach your resistance load to it, then your voltage goes slightly down. Okay. Um, so, buck versus boost, just a terminology thing. Power trackers that are buck means that you take a higher solar array voltage and you decrease it down to your system voltage. If you have boost, it means that you have a lower voltage and you boost it up to a, a higher system voltage. We, in our power trackers there and in the car, use what? Huh? How many people say boost? Raise your hand. And how many people say buck? So, boost. Boost? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, well, for, those who, for those who have a, who, who know, who have a boat, you know, vote and say, how many have, say, buck? Okay, how many say boost? So I've got like one for buck and I've got like four maybe for boost. Okay, here's how I'm going to answer the question. What's the voltage of our array coming in? Buck. Is it? 56? Is it? Is it? The, the, the array provides somewhere around, I think, upper 30s per the, the panel. Right? Because if you think about it, okay, there are 36 cells on, on, on a panel. We've wired two panels together. That's 72 cells. In series, five, a half a volt per cell is 36 volts. Our system voltage is 48. So you have to convert your 36 and boost it up to 40. So then how come Ah, where are you reading that 56 volts from? Which side of the power track? The output side. Right, if you took you know, we, we, we sort of collect all the power trackers into some bus bar, right? That, those red and black connectors. If you read them from there, that's the output of the power trackers. If you read the, the little pins in between uh, on the power tracker itself, you'll read oh, the input. Oh, yeah, that's why it shows like 30, 35. Exactly, exactly. And then that half one shows. So it's converting the 36 into 48. Okay, or 54, because like we said, you, in order to, when you're charging the car, you have your batteries, you know, if you're, if you're up at 3.5 volts, 3.6 volts times 15, you're, you're closer to like 53, 54 volts. If you're at 3.2 times 15, you're at 48. So that's, that's why you read to get to something else. Okay? Good, that's, that's important to understand about that. <clears throat> okay, motor control. Um, so, we say that the motors have to run at a particular voltage level because that's what it expects. And it actually runs most efficiently at that voltage level. Okay? Um, and so, what a motor controller does is um, it tr wants to try to provide that voltage to the car all the time. Yes, you could theoretically vary your uh, your current, but because your your current, um, if you you have this constant resistance, right? And and if you vary the the current, you might vary the voltage, okay? And then it would be less efficient. Ohm's law is great. Um, so what the motor controller does is it does something called pulse width modulation. It's basically if I went and I held a, a switch and I just kept going up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, and I 
you know, and I vary the amount of time it's on and the amount of time that it's off. If I spend less time, you know, in the on position and off position, then it will drive slower. And if I if I spend more time in the on position than off position, then it will drive faster. And that's what this pulse width modulation is. And if you split uh, the period across, let's say four, and you spend one up at the top and three down at the bottom, means that you're driving at 25% of the power. That you have max power, 50%, 75%. And so the motor controller, that's why the, the motor controllers are that way, and there's a circuit in there, and, and big capacitors and things like that, is that when you, when you adjust the throttle, it's telling you what percentage of the time, how much time do I want to spend on the pulse width is longer or shorter based on your adjustment. Okay. Okay. Now motors. Um, there are there are three types of motors that you might hear: brush, brushless, and hub motors. Okay. Um, a brushed motor. The idea is that you have brushes that are here, and you you energize your magnets such that it keeps flipping back and forth the poles. And so it, it then causes this, these brushes to continue to rotate as you keep flipping those things, okay? Um, so obviously there's some resistance that happens, even though it's magnetic, there's gonna be some resistance that happens as you rotate around. So brush motors have uh, less efficiency. A brushless motor, Instead of trying to flip the magnet itself, it energizes the coils instead, and it does it in a in a um, axial configuration. There are three of them, and as you go along, the 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 uh, the magnet stays there. You just energize, energize, energize. And you go and you just keep going in a circle like that. Um, there's less resistance when that happens because this does this thing doesn't need to rotate. The mag, the thing connected to the magnet rotates. Right? So there's, you know, this is just firmly attached. So it's it's less resistance. Um, this type of thing, it, this configuration is uh, also called three phase because phase one, phase two, phase three, or a permanent magnet AC motor, and that's because. Uh, these things are in the sine wave, and so it's AC in terms of alternating current. So um, brushless does not have regenerative braking. Regenerative braking has nothing to do with these concepts. Okay. Um, the the brushless um, idea is just uh, is just this thing. They they can support um, you can support regenerative braking either way. Okay. And actually, it's easier to do regenerative braking on something like this. Because if you think about what is regenerative braking, it's, it's this, you want to slow down this magnet. So if I stop supplying you know, stuff to this motor, and the magnet sort of turns in reverse or slows down, it's going to cause some magnetic you know, flow here, which then will flow back to the battery. Okay, here it's a little hard because uh, you you're sort of um, you have to rotate this, right? And and so it, it requires force to try to move this thing back and forth. Okay, and so uh, it, regenerative braking is a little easier. Um, we uh, I think I think those uh, pancake motors. Um, are brushed DC with the two connectors, but the zero motor is a axial flux three phase permanent AC motor, and so it works this way. Okay. Uh, a hub motor is essentially a specialized brushless motor in which the the drive it's attached to the drive wheel itself, and so. You, you notice that right now we have a chain between our motor and the drive wheel where you have a sprocket on the motor side, it spins very fast, and then you have, it, it 
the, the drive wheel has a bigger sprocket and it's, it then converts it slower. In a, in a hub motor, it just spins the, the wheel itself directly. Okay? the wheel to the motor. Um, the problem with that is, and, and actually I should have put this on the slide, um, motors operate best at a particular RPM, okay, uh, based on how much you provide, you, it's just most efficient at that level. That is typically on the thousands of, uh, of revolutions per minute, okay. If you were to try to rotate your, your, your wheel at that fast, you would be zooming, but you, you can't go anywhere because um, you don't have the torque to, to move the car because it weighs there. What hub motors do is um, it, it does an internal conversion so that it can increase your torque. And, and they call that uh, air gapping. And so um, by, by adjusting the how where the magnets are in and out, then it can adjust. You know, if your magnets are closer together, it will want to spin faster. Whereas if you move the magnets out, there will be less force, it will be spinning slower. So that's what hubbers do. However, so so there's no loss, right, on the hub motor in terms of the chain and stuff. There's no conversion loss. However, you have to rotate a a heavier um, thing on, on your wheel, right? Uh, if you were to install weights on the wheel, it would take more force to try to spin that wheel, right? You now attach a heavy motor onto that thing and say, go! It will take more energy, but it will be more efficient. So it's a balance, and you, you have to see, well, can I get better efficiency, less loss by driving it through a belt or a, or a, or a chain than I can in, in the in wheel? Uh, so we are postulating that maybe we can compete against hub motors just by our current kind of AC motor on a belt track. We'll see. We should attach that hub motor to uh, not designed that way, but <laughs> okay. Um, I'm almost done. Uh, I have this is this is you know 17 to 20 slides. Um, anyway, schematics versus wire diagrams. I always say we don't have a schematic. We have a wiring diagram. The difference between that is. A schematic tells you logically how things are connected. It should be simple. You could look at it and say, oh yes, I understand why this is connected to that. A wiring diagram tells you physically where to lay cables so that you can look at the diagram in the future and say, oh yes, I've laid this cable here. I expect the cable to exist here so I can pull it in and out. We have a wiring diagram. Look at this, right? All of this stuff is the wiring bus that we have next to the driver. Can you follow where things are at? Can you tell me how uh, the motor controller is connected to the motor is connected to the disconnect switches or not? It's kind of hard to tell, right? Um, this is why when, when David and I were having discussions over email, it's like, oh, why are you connecting these switches across here? <laughs> and and he, he, and I tell him no, it's not connected to, towards there. It actually looks this way. He's like, oh, but you can't see that in this. This is a schematic from the Iron Lines team that just tells you, hey, look, I've got a set of batteries. It's connected. Uh, there's a relay here. Here's a switch. Here's the motor controller, and so on. All that stuff. So this is very useful because we need to know where the wires are, we need to know how to repair them, they can tell you colors so you can just track them. I need to know where that wire goes, so you go and, you go and do that. However, I drew this by hand, I, it was kind of hard to do that on the computer at, you know, to a um, This is actually our schematic, high voltage schematic. Okay, I do that by hand. Yeah. 
There's some you know, there is there, there's this, there's this invention, you know, that you, it's called a ruler. It's amazing. You, you just run a run a pencil across or a pen across it, and it draws straight lines miraculously. Okay, this is the high voltage side, and let me. I, I want to walk you through this so that you understand logically how the our car is wired. Okay. Um, I guess I'll just have to use the analysis. Of it. Okay. One thing to note is that there are two parallel circuits, as you know. There's there's a this parallel circuit up here, and then there's this parallel circuit down here. This parallel circuit is our array circuit. This parallel circuit is our motor circuit. And the batteries are in the middle. Okay. We said we get solar cells, they're connected to the power trackers, and then the outputs of that is wired in parallel together. So all the positives, <laughs> all the positive wires are all connected together, all the negative wires are connected together, and they go to the battery. Okay. Here, I show that we have three switches that can cause things to disconnect the circuit, to open the circuit. What are those three switches? You know two of them, right? We have two array disconnects. You know, the, the, motor, uh, the, 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 in, the driver one and the exterior one. Those are represented here in my diagram, array disconnects. What's the third one? Hmm? The BMS isn't at the actual disconnect, but the yes, the BMS controls the contact. the contact. So there's a charge contactor and a discharge contactor. Why do we have those things? So that we don't overcharge. And or overcharge. You don't you don't overcharge or you don't over discharge. Okay? And so not only do we have those two physical manual switches, you have that contact that says the BMS will decide when to disconnect that circuit. Okay. And so, on the, obviously, the, the charge contactor will, will prevent the array from charging the battery, and the discharge contactor will, will control you know, the, the draw coming out. I draw that with a line that says the BMS controls that switch. Okay, that's just a schematic thing. Okay, the BMS. What I also draw here is that it, it takes the the battery information, the battery voltage, and that, you know I just showed the battery is one one whole thing, right? But it has more than that. But it takes that input and it decides whether or not to control those things. That's one of the primary things the BMS does, right? It does battery protection. The other thing it does is um, we know that there are probe wires in between every battery brick, okay? And because, again, V equals IR, um, if you adjust small levels of resistance across those terminals, you can adjust how much current gets flowed into the batteries. And sometimes the batteries start getting out of whack in terms of the voltage, you can then drive more or less current in it to then compensate the people. And so it, it does an equalization thing. Those are two main functions of the BMS. Anyway, uh, coming out of the positive end of the, of the thing is the motor controller, right? Uh, the, the positive ends are tied to the motor. The negative end is just tied to the battery, and then the M minus is what uh, is what the motor uh, drives the motor controller. And so, um, basically, if you if you see the pulse width modulation, it the the positive end will be always up, and then the negative end, depending on you want it on or off, it will be at zero or it will be at the the battery voltage. So that's why it's connected that way. I also show here um, the throttle 
uh, I, I showed that primarily to say that um, the, the little squiggly line is a resistor, the line with an arrow is a potentiometer. The idea is a variable resistor, and it gets wired into the motor control. Finally, our shunts are on the negative. Okay? And I, I show that in here primarily because you, you notice that there are you know two parallel circuits, right? And and the shunt is wired in series so that it can measure current. Okay, so that's why it's in there. I show that we have an array shunt, so it tells you how much is getting into the battery. And then we have a net um, that says how much you're getting from the, uh, from the battery to the motor. Actually, I think that this really belongs here. I just drew that. Okay. So it tells you how much you're actually getting from the battery, not how much is being driven uh, to the motor. Okay? So if you look at this, you know, we have a lot of wires on the car, but it's not that difficult of a circuit to understand, right? There are three components, they're all wired in parallel with each other, and we tap on some instrumentation and switches. So logically we understand how it works. Of course, physically we've got a lot of wires. Any questions on this? Do you understand what we're doing here? Uh, quick thing on electrical safety. You know, we talk about short circuits. Um, the thing is this. Um, you... Any, any, we, we say that your the resistance, the, the circuit runs current to areas with the least resistance. And so if you are grounded to the frame, and then you touch the frame and you, you, know, you work on the car, you could cause a short circuit, and, and you might be at a lower resistance than what's in the car. And so the electricity will just go through you. That's why we say, when you're working on the car, well, first off, we say a lot of times you you put wires in and then you have to modify things. You have to cut things, you have to drill things, and you can cause punctures in the wire if you're not careful. And that's an easy way to ground to the car. Okay? And we still have to figure out what's up with the car on our car. But the idea is to prevent that, and as a normal course of action, when you're working on electrical things, especially the high voltage stuff, we recommend that either you work with one hand and you're off the frame. Right? We always say, okay, you know, work with one hand, fine, fine, fine. But you know, if you're leaning, and, and especially if you're wearing shorts, and you're leaning against the frame, and you're working with one hand, you're still causing a short just through you know, a different part of your body. So. You know, you, you need to be aware of that. Try to stay off the frame, okay? Because you don't know. Frame is the easiest way to get a short, and so you want to stay off the frame. Either that, or you wear electrical gloves, right? So then, then you you can't cause a circuit to go through. Uh, lithium battery fires. Um, this was a big thing that Andy had uh, talked about, uh, or uh, has has is familiar with, but. Um, so, lithium batteries are very prone, not prone to fire, but if a fire happens, it's very, very bad. Because it, when a lithium battery gets on fire, it releases a poisonous gas. Okay? Which means that if you see a spark in the battery thing, or if you... If anything like that happens, the best thing to do is to escape quickly and go upwind. Yeah, that's important, upwind. Don't go downwind, because then it's, the, the gas will just chase you. If we happen to have a class D fire extinguisher, which is the yellow canister, which we don't have here, um, then you could try to fight the fire, because it um, a class D fire extinguisher uses a particular chemistry that can put out lithium fires. That's what class D fire extinguishers are. Most fire extinguishers are class ABC, 
which is just like different types of uh, things. They're red canisters. Um, that's going to do nothing for lithium fires. So typically what we say is if you don't got one of those, go upwind, go away from the car as fast as possible, and then call the fire department. They know how to handle it. So we, we put in precautions. You know, we, we have a battery box that will vent out uh, and, and, we'll, and it has protection so that you know, if you're working on it, yeah, you are not, uh, sparks can't get in there and so on. We're fairly well protected from that, but it's just a heads up if that happens. My final slide. <coughs> Troubleshooting. Okay. Um, most of the time with electrical stuff, you're chasing down shorts and openings. Okay? Right now, we're chasing down shorts. If you look, um, what does a short mean? It means that you have some sort of load, right, and some sort of battery, but somehow you sort of bypass that. And the way you bypass that is you can say, oh, well, this is connected to the frame, and that somehow is connected to the frame, so essentially that makes a connection here because the frame is conducted, right? So how do you chase that down? Well, if I were to disconnect this, because I, I don't know where it's connected to the frame, right? So if I disconnect this, well, I'm still connected to the frame, right? So I actually have to disconnect it at multiple places. If I disconnect it there, then I can see that this is not connected to the frame, that's not, you know, um, now you have to disconnect that at multiple places in order to, to finally find and isolate where it's like, Even here, by disconnecting this, it's not going to find it. <coughs> because this wire is connected to the frame. Which means then this wire is connected to the frame. I have to do this, and then I can and, and, and this, and then I can start saying, oh, well, this wire from here to here is connected to the frame. And this wire connected to the frame. And these wires are not. Right? So you have to really start disconnecting things, and that's what we were chasing down. That's what we continue we need to continue chasing down. What's also interesting is uh, what we what we found out is well, what if you have additional circuits? And um, what's even more interesting is you have components in which you have more things attached to it. Okay? Um, so, this is the BMS, this is the, the high voltage system, and this is the 12 volt system. Well, we're using 12 volts to power the BMS, and the BMS is regulating this high voltage stuff. Now, if there's a short here to the frame, because it's connected to BMS, and typically, internally, they make a common ground, then that means that this is also connected to frame. Right? So, what we had to do was we had to disconnect this from the thing to isolate the high voltage side from the low voltage side. Right? And so you have to start disconnecting things, and then you set it to resistance, and you, you test between points and say, is there a resistance there? If there's no resistance, it means it's an open, which is a good thing. If, it's, if there is resistance, then there, there is some connectivity that we have to chase it down. Opens is the, the, the flip side. You know, I said opens are a good thing. Opens are a good thing for shorts, right? You, shorts are unintended circuits, and if you can open that circuit, great. If you have an intended circuit and you're not getting power to it, it means that you have an open. Which means, you know, maybe you accidentally snipped the wire or uh, some, something happened that's a malfunctioning wire and it's not flowing the, the electricity through it. And so the way to do that is you just start looking for connectivity between the two points and say, you know, where is the break and then you replace the wire. So, um, you know, when you, when you deal with electrical problem and why things aren't powered or 
why, uh, why we have some loss. It's really uh, short snow. And this is how we chase them. Questions? Yes? Um, is it no resistance? Uh, I, I know what you're asking, and the answer is yes, but it, it's, a, it's more complicated than that. Low resistance means that there's connectivity between those two devices in which there is, you know, it, it, it's more of a wire than a stuff. If you say, hey, I intended it to be that way, like, I have a wire, and that wire should have a near zero resistance, right? Because I don't want power lost through it. So it's good. Low resistance is good for a wire. And I, if I intended to connect one thing to another thing through that wire, that low resistance is good. If I didn't want that circuit to be there, low resistance is very bad. Because it's saying that uh, my electricity is going to flow through that unintended circuit over all the high resistance parts. Right? So that's really the difference between low resistance and high resistance. Right? Other questions? Yes? Well, so typically a short, uh, like, especially when we say short to a frame, it means that there is some component that's grounded to that frame. In general, typically it would be, hey, the installation rubbed off and there's some con conduction to the frame, or uh, maybe there's something wrong with that component that, it, it, you know, let's say it's a motor controller where the frame is, is metal, right? The, the housing is metal and it's attached to the frame and then there's some leakage from your terminals to that, you know, uh, to, to, the, to the structure. Then you just replace those things. That's basically what it is. When you isolate it down to the culprit, whether it be a wire component, you just replace that frame. Or you may have to remount, right? So, for example, if you isolated it to a terminal strip, maybe the screws are, are touching a wire, and then you use that screw to mount to the car. Well, all that means is, can you find a way to take that wire off the mounting screw, or, uh, or you use a nylon screw or something like that so that it doesn't conduct the thing. Um, one thing to know, and I think most of you guys know this, if there is voltage from the car to the frame, the race will not allow you to run. Okay, so we need to find that that's critical. Okay. Other questions? I hope this gives you a bit of understanding about how our electrical systems work. Uh, obviously, there's less application in there than if I were to have you work on the test uh, thing, but at least you understand how things are wired and what what all the concepts about you know power and current and voltage and stuff are. Uh, if you guys think of any questions along the way, feel free to let me know. That's all I got. Longer than I expected. Sorry, it's like two hours. <laughs> two hours. Thank you so much. All right. So.